Hey all, Grim here. Welcome to the first real episode of my Dark Souls modding tutorial series, including a look into the making of both the original Dark Souls and my Daughters of Ash mod. As I explained in the introduction video, I'm going to be introducing modding concepts gradually as we move through the different areas of Laudron. My original intention was to do one video per area, starting here with Filing Shrine, but it became increasingly obvious as I was recording this video that there was just way too much for one episode, particularly here at the start of the series. So this video will focus on setting up the modding environment and going through the basics of map data, with two or three more introductory videos still to come in Filing Shrine. Before we load up the game, we'll need to download Soulstruct, the multi-purpose modding tool I designed for Dark Souls. Technically Soulstruct is a Python package, it's written in the Python programming language, but if you're only after the main GUI, you can get it from Nexus Mods or my GitHub page as a bundled executable and not worry about the Python side of it at all. That's what I'll be doing here. Down the road, we'll install Soulstruct manually and take a look at some of the extra features it offers more experienced programmers, like making large batches of changes all at once. You can place this executable anywhere you want. I'm putting mine in my YouTube folder. Then run it the same way you run any other executable. It will ask you to choose a directory for your Soulstruct project, which I'm nesting here in this folder as well, and then your Dark Souls game executable. This will most likely be inside your Steam installation, under Steam, Steam Apps, Common, then either Dark Souls Prepare to Die Edition, or Dark Souls Remastered. Soulstruct is compatible with both versions of the game, but comes with a few extra bells and whistles for Dark Souls Remastered, and that's what I'll be using in this series. If you do want to use the non-remastered version of the game, which is sadly no longer available on Steam, note that the game executable is actually one folder deeper under this data folder. I go to these game folders fairly often, so you can see I have them pinned in my Explorer sidebar here. You may also get a Windows smart screen or even an antivirus warning the first time you run Soulstruct because of its nature as a Python executable. If you do, I hope you can trust me and press on. After choosing our project directory and game executable, Soulstruct will offer to import all the game files into your new project, which we'll accept. Let's take a look at these imported files. The D1S files are the project's local copies of all the game data Soulstruct can handle. Whenever we click save in Soulstruct, the corresponding D1S file will be updated. These files are actually raw Python data, which is much faster for Soulstruct to load than if we were to save them as real game files. The event and talk files are a bit different. These are just plain text scripts, and they're organized under their respective maps in these two subfolders. Finally, this config.json file contains some basic project settings, like the location of the game executable. Two files will also be created next to the Soulstruct executable after we run it for the first time. The soulstruct.log file is simply a text file containing output messages from the last time Soulstruct was run. If you get any error messages in Soulstruct, details will be recorded here for bug reports. The config.py file contains certain Soulstruct defaults that you may want to edit, like your system Steam path. I'm going to change mine to point to my G drive, where Steam is installed on my PC. You can also optionally set a default project directory. If you do, Soulstruct will open that project folder automatically when run, instead of asking you to find it. Make sure to use either forward slashes or double backslashes when specifying these paths. You can also change your default project directory from the file menu inside Soulstruct while you have that project open. Time to dive into Soulstruct, and we'll start by talking about the Maps tab. This tab is responsible for editing the MSB files in the game, which you can find in the Map slash Map Studio directory in both versions. These files fully determine the contents of each map by loading models, meshes, and textures contained in all of these other subdirectories inside the map folder, as well as object models and character models from other directories. There are 17 maps in Dark Souls, each with a different four-part ID, and they don't correspond one-to-one -one with all the named areas you might be familiar with. Undead Burg and Undead Parish, for example, are contained in a single map, M1001. The same is true for the Great Hollow and Ash Lake, Blight Town and Quellag's Domain, and others that you can see here. You can also see that certain maps share parts of their ID. The first two digits are the area code of that map. Maps with the same area code load their environmental model textures from the same location, and use the same set of lighting parameter tables. The next two digits are the block code, which distinguishes maps inside the same area. The two digits after that are always zero, as you can see, so don't worry about those. Finally, the last two digits represent a version number, which is zero for every map except Darkroot Garden. This is because a new version of this map, namely version 1, was released along with the DLC, and it includes the portal that takes you to Ulusil. We can still find the old version 0 file inside the Map Studio folder, but it's completely useless, because you're always going to have the DLC when you're on PC. Soulstruct will always look for version 1 of this map, so feel free to delete the old one if you're worried about getting them confused. And one more note before we dig into the map data. The MSB files used in the original Prepare to Die edition on PC and the new remastered edition are completely identical, except for the few genuine changes they made in DSR, like that new bonfire near Vamos in the catacombs. 
Other than that, you can simply copy and paste these files from one game to another. This is not the case for any of the other file types we'll be looking at in this video series, so keep that in mind. Entries in the Maps tab are divided into four types, each with numerous subtypes. The most important entries are parts, which are all of the physical entities that are placed inside the map. We'll be focusing almost entirely on objects and characters in the early days here, but let's quickly go through all the other types. Player starts simply to find the default position of the player in each map, which the game often uses if it loses track of your position for any reason, like save data corruption, and sometimes other warp points as well. Map pieces are the textured 3D meshes that give the map its static visual appearance. Whether it's buildings, caves, trees, mountains, distant scenery, the sky, or anything else that's a fixed part of the environment. Note that these map pieces are for appearances only. Physics are provided by collisions, which are invisible 3D meshes that form floors, walls, and ceilings. Naturally, these collisions usually overlap the map pieces perfectly, but there are plenty of map pieces that are partially or entirely without collisions, like distant scenery or high parts of cliffs the game never expects you to be able to reach. There are also special types of collisions that serve functions other than just being a solid barrier, like kill planes and death camera trigger planes, or collisions that only exist for enemies. Collisions also control which parts of the map are visible at any given time. When the player stands on a collision, they activate one or more display groups. Any entry in the map whose draw groups overlap the display groups of the player's current collision, whether it's another collision, a map piece, an object or a character, will be enabled in the game. Navigation meshes, or nav meshes, have a lot in common with collisions, in the sense that they're 3D meshes that mostly define the ground you can walk on. But as the name suggests, they're used for enemy AI pathfinding rather than physics. They also have a more complicated role in causing maps to load that we'll look at later. Note that the relationship between nav meshes and collisions is usually one-to-one, -one, and almost every nav mesh will overlap the collision with the same model ID, but this isn't always the case. Map pieces, on the other hand, tend to be larger than both collisions and nav meshes. The unused object and unused character categories have exactly the same data fields as normal objects and characters, except they're just never actually enabled in the map. Sometimes these assets are used exclusively in cutscenes, like the three Batwing demons in Sense Fortress, but usually they're just cut content that was more swept under the rug than removed from the game. Be careful removing these entries, and make sure they're not involved in any of the cutscenes you want to keep in your mod. Finally, map connections are special add-ons that are associated with certain collisions. The display groups of collisions only apply to the map those collisions are part of, but this isn't much help when, say, we want to see the entrance to the catacombs before we leave the cemetery stairs in Filing Shrine. Map connections are simply collisions that can activate the draw groups of another map. They don't do anything other than that. The good news is that you'll never have to worry about any of this if you're not planning on editing the map environment itself. If you are interested in that, we'll get into it in a future video. Otherwise, probably 90% of modding you do to map parts will be changing characters, and the rest will be objects. The second category of map entries are regions. Regions include points, which simply define specific positions in the map, and three types of volumes, spheres, cylinders, and boxes. Regions are used for a variety of purposes, like defining the locations of event triggers and enemy attack zones, but most of them define the coordinates of map events, which are the third category of map entry. Spawn point events, for example, are attached to point regions, and sound events are attached to volumes. It's hard to go into the event types in any detail beyond what's probably a bit obvious from their names, so we'll save all of them for future videos. The fourth, final, and simplest map entry types are models. Every part entry has a reference to a model entry that must appear here in the appropriate list in the same map. You can think of these model lists as a way of telling the game which assets it needs to load into memory when the map is first loaded. Once the model assets are available, they can be used by multiple parts. Note that the name of the model entry is critical, with the first letter specifying the type of model and the next four digits specifying the model ID. All the other map types we've looked at, parts, regions, and events, can be named anything you want, but model names must take this form. Models only have a single data field, the SIB path, which points to an internal placeholder model. This field has a consistent structure as well, depending on the map ID and the model type. Solstruct makes model management fairly easy, as we'll see shortly. And one final note before we dive into Filing Shrine properly, I mentioned that collisions have display groups, and that any part whose draw groups overlap the current display group will be visible or enabled in the game. This is true for collisions and map pieces, but objects and characters, and their unused variants, have an extra option, the draw parent field. If the draw parent is set for an object or character, it will inherit the draw groups from that parent, which thankfully saves us from needing to manually set the draw groups for every single character. In practice, the draw parent for a character will almost always be the collision that character is standing on. Whenever that collision is enabled by the player's current display groups, any object or character standing on it will therefore be drawn as well. 
So to change the position of an object or character, we need to modify three fields. It's translate, rotate, and draw parent. Let's try it out with the first Hollow Warrior we encounter as we head toward Undead Berg. He needs a real name though, I'm going to call him Boris, and I'll make it official by changing his name in the maps tab here. All of the default character names are just the model ID, followed by an underscore and then the index of that character. I think keeping the model ID is a good idea, but since the index doesn't really mean anything, and often there are plenty of values missing anyway, I like to put something more descriptive after the underscore, like Boris. You might be wondering at this point how I identified which Hollow Warrior Boris actually is, and how we're going to find the coordinates for any new location we want to give him. We have three options for doing this. The first is to use Catalash's Map Studio program, which is an incredible piece of software that tries to emulate the real 3D map editor used by the developers at FromSoft. In this program, we can click on anything we want and see not only its name, which lets us identify it in Solstruct, but all of the other fields that Solstruct presents as well. Then we can simply drag objects and characters around and adjust their position and rotation to whatever values we want. Then you can click the collision that your entity is now standing on and set that collision name as the draw parent. All of the same data fields are available here as in Solstruct. Ultimately, both programs are simply editing the MSB file of that map. But Map Studio does it in a much more hands-on way. If you're editing the environment, or you just want to explore the maps and get a sense for where all the different collisions and regions are, I highly recommend using Map Studio. I've linked to some existing tutorials for it in the description below. There are only really two drawbacks to using Map Studio. The first is that it isn't actually compatible with Dark Souls Remastered yet. Instead, you'll need to make changes in the Prepare to Die edition, then copy the edited MSB files over to the Map Studio folder in DSR. Fortunately, like I mentioned, both games use exactly the same MSB format, so that's not a big deal, unless of course you don't already own the old version of the game. The second drawback is that it can just be a bit finicky to manually place dozens of objects and characters at the exact position you want them, especially when you're trying to adjust their height. Of course, this isn't an issue with the program itself, which is state of the art as far as I'm concerned, but just the nature of editing things in a 3D space, and an inability to visualize what they'll look like in the context of the real map. So what are the alternatives for changing coordinates? Well, if you have the debug DLL extension made for Dark Souls Remastered by Horcrux, link in the description below, you can view the coordinates of everything in the map, including the player, while the game is loaded. This is exactly what I did for Daughters of Ash with the old version of Dark Souls, before Catalash's map studio existed. I ran around the map standing in exactly the spots where I wanted to place something, and manually copied the player's coordinates, angle, and current collision into the translate, rotate, and draw parent fields of that entry. That's not something I recommend for anyone who needs more than a few coordinates, but Solstruct takes the same idea and makes it a whole lot easier. If we go to the Runtime tab, we can click Hook Game to hook into Dark Souls Remastered while the game is running. This gives Solstruct the ability to read the player's current position, angle, and draw parent straight from the game's memory, which we can do by right-clicking on any of these fields and choosing whatever option we want. With all that said, let's send Boris on a vacation to Firelink's graveyard. We'll stand where we want him to appear, then right-click his translate and choose to copy all three fields from the player's current state. Then I'll save the map's data to the project, export it to the game, and reload to make the game read the new edited file. Let's mix things up a little bit now and give Boris the promotion he's always dreamed of by turning him into a clone of Pinwheel. This is as simple as changing his model ID from C2540, the ID for a Hollow Warrior, to C3320, Pinwheel's model. Solstruct actually lets us do this by just right-clicking the model name field and opening a complete list of all the character models in the game, so we don't have to memorize any of the IDs. When we double-click the model we want, Solstruct will warn us that this model hasn't been added to the data for this map yet and offer to do it for us. After accepting, we can check and see that C3320 has indeed been added to the character model list. After exporting and reloading the map again, we'll see Boris's new form. Unfortunately for Boris, he's actually no tougher right now than he was when he was a hollow, and we get the same amount of souls for killing him. Making Boris into Pinwheel for real means we need to change him on the inside as well. If we go and look at his character entry again, we'll see he has two fields called Character ID and AI ID. The Character ID points to an entry in the Characters parameter table, and this is going to be our jumping off point for exploring the game parameters, or params for short. The params are basically a set of spreadsheets, and nothing more. All sorts of numeric game data is stored here, like weapon and armor stats, attack damage, item effects, buffs and debuffs, player character faces, and even lower level things like camera settings and menu colors. We're going to start off in the Characters table, which defines the stats of every unique enemy type in the game. When I say enemy type though, I don't just mean the enemy model. Hollow Warriors, for example, have numerous entries covering the different weapons they can have equipped, and the different maps they can appear in, 
including extra entries for the Black Phantom versions. We can quickly paste any of the entry names into Google Translate to find out what that entry is for. The names are usually pretty descriptive, though you'll have to get used to some of FromSoft's internal naming techniques. We could scroll down to Boris's character ID manually, but we can also just right click on his field in the maps entry and take the link from there to the params tab. As long as Boris is using this entry, he'll have the same stamina, health, item drops, etc. from his previous life as a Hollow Warrior. We don't want to edit this param entry either because the other Hollow Warriors in Firelink Shrine are still using it. Instead, we just want to find the existing entry for Pinwheel and use that. Fortunately, the IDs are sensible here. The first four digits of each entry in the character table will match the model ID of the enemy it's designed for, as you can tell here with Boris's 2540 00 ID. This is just a convention, but it's a very sensible one. If we scroll down to the six digit entries starting with 3320, we see the different variants of Pinwheel available. One for the boss itself, one for the clones that spawn during the fight, and one for the lesser pinwheels that appear in the Tomb of the Giants. Let's go ahead and use the boss version for Boris, which is simply 3320 00. The other update we need to make to complete Boris's transformation is to his AI ID. He may have the exterior and the heart of Pinwheel now, but he still has the brain of a hollow warrior, and internally he still thinks he's swinging a sword. Let's follow this link to the AI param table. This entry contains information about how close you have to get to Boris for him to aggro, how far he'll chase you before retreating, how well he can hear things behind him, and so on. It doesn't contain any details about how he chooses which attacks to use or what he does when he's not in combat, but it does refer to the pair of AI scripts that do exactly that, which are here in the Logic ID and Battle ID fields. These IDs are used to look up internal scripts written in Lua, which is a high-level programming language often used by programs written in C or C++. We'll get into those in a future video. For now, let's just change Boris's AI ID to 33200. AI entries often have very similar IDs to character entries in the params, but make sure not to get them confused, as they do often differ slightly. Typically, many different character entries for a given enemy model will share the same AI entry. When they do have multiple AI entries, it's usually just to customize their eyesight range and aggro distance. Also note that each character entry actually has a default AI ID already there. If you leave the AI ID in the map entry as minus one, this default value from the character entry will be used instead. But in practice, FromSoft never does that. It's always manually specified in the map, which is a good idea, I think. Unfortunately, he's not great at navigating the obstacles here, and some of his abilities, like teleportation, don't have the event scripts required for them to work properly. Also note that the reason I chose Pinwheel for Boris is because we're standing close enough to the catacombs here that Pinwheel's AI script and visual effects will coincidentally be loaded into the game's memory. If we had tried to give Boris Pinwheel's AI without moving him from his original position near the aqueduct, he wouldn't actually function at all. The fact that AI scripts are only loaded in specific maps is honestly one of the most annoying parts of Dark Souls modding, but we'll look into that in a future episode. The last thing I want to show you just before I sign off is how to export Soulstruct projects to arbitrary directories. In the file menu, select export to, rather than export to game, and then choose the data type you want to export, or the entire project. The folder we export to will be structured in a way that mimics the structure of the game installation. Anyone who wants to install your mod can then just copy and paste the contents of this export directory into their game folder. We can also import from arbitrary folders, as long as they have this structure as well. That's all I'm going to cover today, and I'm sure it's certainly been enough to take in, but we'll be sticking around Filing Shrine for a few videos to come, where we look at player characters, treasure chests and object activations, equipment parameters, item lots, event scripts, and more. I want to give a very warm thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. If you enjoy these tutorials, and any of my other work like Daughters of Ash, or you're looking forward to Dark Souls Nightfall, you can support me on Patreon through the link in the description below. Patrons can get early access to videos, a vote in some of my projects, and an invitation to a monthly modding Q&A stream. Your support is ultimately what makes this all possible for me. Join me next time when I open some treasure chests and torture Crestfallen Warrior just a little bit. Until then, stay human.